Hello, and welcome to Mornings with Joel, commercial real estate podcast, where we focus on rising stars and established players in commercial real estate and talk to them about how they are building legacies in today's marketplace. Good morning, everyone. Happy to have you with us here for the Mornings with Joel CRE podcast. We're very excited. And today we have the legendary Sabine Apollon Lopez. So we're very, very excited to have her here with us. Sabine, I got to be honest. Um, you know, every time I turn around, it's like, you need to talk to Sabine. You need to talk to Sabine. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you really have become a, a legend in our uh, marketplace of nowhere else. So, <laughs> so we certainly appreciate you being here today and I'm um, excited to have you. And uh, thank you for calling out a little bit of time to be with us. So for those who don't know, which uh, I doubt is anybody, but uh, give us a little bit of background as to um, who you are and, and what you're doing right now in this commercial real estate space. Sure, sure. So again, Sabine Apollon Lopez, and I am first and foremost, mother of three wonderful children. My eldest is 22 at Berkeley College in Boston of music, and I have twins that are seniors this year. So I will be an empty nester in less than a year. So looking forward to that. Right. But on the professional side, I am at Cushman and Wakefield, um, my four years going on five years soon, and senior director for project and development services, our PDS team, and working on variable projects and national accounts. Okay. Okay. Well, sounds good. Sounds good. So, I, you know, obviously we, we do a little digging into our guests to, uh, Make sure that they're a, a quality candidate to have on the show. And I must say, I mean, it's like all these different Fortune 500 companies uh, turn to you for advice in commercial real estate. So how did you, you get there? I mean, if you could give us a little bit of, of background, because, you know, we, we do this to kind of inspire the next generation of folks in commercial real estate. So what was your journey like to, uh, to get to this point to where you're such an authority in the industry? I think like most, uh, my journey to corporate real estate is really not one that it was written in the books. Um, I actually started out my, well, let's back up a little bit. I grew up in New York and I went to one of the three specialized high schools in the tri-state area. Um, you kill me? Which one? Brooklyn Tech. Get out of here. Tech Knight. <laughs> you know that, that we're, um, we're co-alumni? <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't, that too. How about that? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yes, wow. Tech Knight. I bleed blue. There we go. There you go. Right there on Fort Green Points. That's right. That's right. Ben Stein. Yes, yes. Oh, man. Wow. Okay. So, we'll have to talk about that offline. Yes, yes. So graduated from Tech. And as you know, I picked my I picked my 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 major when I entered and I thought I wanted to be engineering. That didn't last long <laughs> <laughs> and switched over to design architecture. And um, I did that, you know, for the rest of my years there. And I was lucky enough in my junior year to intern during the uh, after hours, after school, as well as on the holidays with the one of the only black architectural firms, the John Johnson McNeil up on 72nd Street. And I interned with them for two years, thinking, again, I was going to continue in architecture. And lo and behold, a project that I was working on, and I was literally doing sepia blueprints and really the gopher of the office at the time. But lo and behold, I was actually working on the renovation of the Apollo Theater. Okay. And so that sort of set my path, you know, going through that. And um, once I graduated... I went to um, FIT for design okay. and finished up my degree there. And soon after, I worked for one of the top, at the time, ISD, one of the top interior design firms in New York, and then to a second, to a third. It, my, I was probably 24, 25 years old. I got an opportunity to work for Blue Cross and Blue Shield of New Jersey. And there I worked, I was given a, a role that I didn't even think I was I was ready for, or I was even qualified for, but I I managed a one million square foot new renovation, new new actually new build, Blue Cross and Blue Shield at the time, wow. and that was an opportunity that I just literally set my path mm -hmm. um, to where I am today. Wow, and that was in your twenties. 
That was, yes. Wow. Yes. So fast forward to the corporate real estate. I moved here. I moved into Georgia in 2006 and working for a design build firm. And lo and behold, I moved to another smaller firm. And later, I'd say about two years later, I uh, that uh my, the company I was working for was purchased by Studley back then, who's now Savalas. And that's how I ended up in commercial real estate because I that was not a path that I was even thinking about, that didn't even know about. And all of a sudden, I'm working for a commercial real estate company on the, for the project side. And that's that's how it ever, it ever <laughs> the evolution started. And now I'm at my third, my third commercial real estate company in 15 years. Wow, wow, pretty impressive, especially at, at such a young age. So congratulations on that. Of course, that was your training at Brooklyn Tech, so we got to give them some credit for that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly oh, right. Yeah, 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 no, that's good stuff. Wow, I would have never thought I would get that information this morning, but that's good stuff. So certainly appreciate it. Well, fantastic. So, so fast forward. Um, you've been doing great things, and what's one of the things that that you would say was a lesson that you've learned as regards getting into this space? Is it just being fortunate or is it positioning? Is it knowing the right people? Is it, you know, what, what would you say was one of those, those key things also? I think it's a few things. I think it's networking. Again, okay. I, I believe in the network is really your net worth is really who you, who you know. And again, that opportunity I talked about in Blue Cross and Blue Shield is something that I got, like I said, I didn't even know that I was even prepared for, but someone who didn't look like me saw something in me that I didn't see and gave me that opportunity. Um, so being in the right room mm-hmm. with the right people is number one. Number two is really showing up as who you are, right? Showing up authentically and really just knowing your audience and knowing, knowing your worth. And I think that's where I think what happened, what has happened to me over the years is being in the right place at the right time, knowing the right people and really just being true to yourself. Right, right. Understand, understand. So let me ask this, if someone was to um, to reach out to you for assistance, what would you say is the, the uh, biggest area of focus? Because I know you do project management and, and some other things. So what would be the, the real focus of a you know, circumstance where a person would say, hey, we need to call Sabine and bring her in on this. You kind of gave us a little bit about that earlier, but go a little bit deeper if you don't mind. I think, I think it's twofold. Obviously, project management, design, architecture, all of construction, all of that is in my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also, you know, my passion and my purpose I've found over the last years is really helping helping our community, helping those that are, are not fortunate enough to even know that this exists. Mm-hmm. And especially for our minorities and the under underrepresented in our company as our in our world. And as you know, whether it's our company, whether it's all of the top threes, we are a very small one digit percentage in terms of demographics within the commercial real estate firm. And one of my purposes is really to to have awareness across across the globe, possibly to get into commercial, because, again, it's a it's a field that. As you know, there's so many different vast opportunities and roles that we play that we're not even aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. So, Sabine, talk to me a little bit more about that. Um, Why do you think that is? Why do you think so few minorities are are in this space? Because you're right, I hear anything, you know, the average number I hear is generally about 3%, but Blacks make up about 16% of the population. So that's a big disparity when you look at it. Well, why do you think that is, in, in your opinion? I think it's awareness. I think it's visibility. Mm-hmm. Um, again, my example, 15 years ago, I'd never thought I'd work for a commercial real estate company. And so our children, our 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 generational, it's just, you know, you've got the other side where from the time that they are born and able to walk, they're at the country clubs, they're at the golf courses, they're at these vacation homes with folks that are in the real estate company. And, and they, it just, it just kind of sort of, it's generational and precedes itself. Whereas our community, we really don't have that opportunity. And so we don't know that it exists. So we don't know financial analysts actually exist in commercial real estate. We don't know that you know we have project management within commercial real estate. We don't know we have engineering within. So I think it's just awareness that this is a, a field, no matter where you are, no matter where you are in your education or even your profession, there may be a niche right within commercial real estate that you just need to explore. Yeah, yeah, you bring up a good point. 
you know, I, I often talk about this and um, you can certainly relate to it, but you think on the, the A train, the D train, for an example, from 125th Street to Columbus Circle at 59th Street is one stop, right, on the express. And yet and still you have Harlem and Billionaire's Row. That's right. And it's one stop, <laughs> one stop. And yet and still there's so many folks that would never believe that they could live on Billionaire's Row, build those buildings on Billionaire's Row, or have any relation to it whatsoever, and it's only one stop That's right. uh, down. And it's 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 an amazing thing when you think about it. I know when I was growing up, uh, the way out seemed to be either sports or hip hop, you know, at the time. And and that's the, the dynamic for a lot of people. It wasn't real estate, you know. You, right. you never thought of that. Or you look at a building and you say, okay, the down payment is, you know, ten million dollars. It's like, well, my mommy and daddy don't have that, so where am I going to get that money from? You just look elsewhere. That's right. So, so it's a matter of exposure. I really appreciate you sharing that. What do you think we can do to uh, increase the exposure for more minorities and younger ones as it relates to CRE? Uh, again, I think it's it's really just reaching out, leaning in. I know with my children, all of my children's friends, they all know what I do, and I encourage them. And I I've, I've been successful so far in in, in a, quite a many that are going into the field. Every chance you get is to talk to talk about what you do, talk about what the opportunities are, not to sway them one way or the other. But again, just giving them the awareness. Um, again, I think the REAP program, I send so many people at the REAP program just again, just to get a basis of what commercial real estate is. That is a great avenue to get people in, engaged and get people involved and just know what's what's out there. And you get, you know, as you know, during going through the REAP program, you get the, a, a multitude of aspects of real estate that you would have never known that exists. So again, at Cushman and Wakefield, we are, I think, I'm, I may be wrong here, but I believe we probably put over 30, 30 applicants through the REAP, pro, the REAP Academy and including myself. <laughs> and I did my, I did, even though I've had, I'm in the business way over 30 years, but I, I did the program back in the fall of 2020. Again, just, I wanted to be part of there. I'm the, I'm, I'm the, the champion behind it on Cushman and Wakefield and wanted to make sure I experienced it myself. And it's an excellent program. And like I said, we've put probably 30 applicants through, through the program thus far. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that's fantastic. And I'm glad you're there kind of pushing the door open, you know, in order to make that happen. One thing I certainly like about REAP is that it, it exposes you to the multiple avenues of real estate. You know, even when we started this, this podcast, it was the idea of having folks just see how we put deals together. Yeah. But a lot of folks said, I don't want to do capital markets, right? I want to do leasing. I want to build. I want to do this, do that. So right. we decided to open up to a, a broader scope. So I certainly appreciate you sharing that. You know, one thing also that uh, we were certainly focusing in on this month was access to capital. And uh, I kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier. What do you think can be done in order to give minorities access to capital? You know, when you look at smaller commercial real estate deals, generally those deals start off with friends and family, right? That's the general buzzword. You know, you get a couple hundred grand from here and a couple hundred grand from there. But in so many of the minority communities, they don't have those relatives that have you know, that can write you a half a million dollar check to, to get into a deal. So mm-hmm. you have that issue. And then when it gets to the bigger deals, like you mentioned a minute ago, uh, you don't have that exposure. So what do you think can be done to help uh, more minorities have access to capital? And is Christian Wakefield doing anything in that regard? So that is a growing a growing area within Cushman and Wakefield. Again, I think for those of us, especially whether you're in your commercial side of it, is again, just really networking and getting and getting to you know, the right doors open to you. Mm-hmm. And again, if you have a compelling, a compelling project or or initiative is really getting into the right room and knowing the right who to, who to come to and opening the right doors for you. That's where it's going to that's where it's going to take take leaps and bounds, right? You can't do it by yourself. Again, we don't have the 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 capital in our in our homes or in our families or even our friends to do that. So you have to partner. You have to partner with others that are going to be able to make that happen for you. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's a, a very, very powerful thought about partnering because um so many people want to go at it alone. Now we've seen some really, really big deals where the, the folks are so scared that somebody's going to steal the deal that they won't bring people in and then they wind up losing it. So that that's a very, very powerful point as well, is trying to do that. You know, a lot of companies have been um, talking about how they want to open up diversity and provide money for capital, especially after the George Floyd situation. 
From your perspective, have you seen many uh, companies actually walking the walk as it relates to that? When it's uh, <laughs> putting company money out there on the street? I have, and I can speak personally on Cushman and Wakefield. And I know in general, everybody was, it was the hot topic, right? Post George Floyd's murder, et cetera. Everybody was willing to give money and open doors, et cetera. Unfortunately, at least what I'm seeing, and this is my personal, my personal take, there has been a bit of a dec- decline. Other initiatives, we were into war. We've got so many other things that are happening that it's sort of taking a back seat. I think overall, Fortune 500 companies are still, it's DEI is, is, is certainly a, co- a conversation that's happening, but I see there's not as much of a focus that there, there was 18 months ago. And so again, with Cushman and Wakefield, like we are trying to keep that alive and we're trying to, to make it still the conversation. We're still having those hard conversations. We're still recruiting talent, keeping talent within our company and promoting them and develop them, developing them as much as we possibly can and partnering with some of exter- external organizations as well. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. So talk to me, if you don't mind, a little bit about the, the partnering that you mentioned that um, Cushman, Cushman Wakefield does. Uh, what does that look like? And, and what type of deals, what type of situations are they are partnering with folks? So I'm what I probably didn't say in my intro is I'm the chair elect for our build uh, Cushman Wakefield Build organization and Build stands for for Blacks United in Leadership and Development. And so 2023, I'm the chair elect for for Cushman. And within Build itself, we partnered again as REAP. I talked about the REAP partnership, but we we've done the McKenzie program mm-hmm. for management teams. Um, we're doing the ELC management the management, the MMLMS program that's happening in October. And again, these are all programs that we're taking our internal team and developing them and putting them in, in, and this is company paid. We're sponsoring them. We're developing them within our company just to give, again, we want, we want the, 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 like you said, 3% of our organization, not just in low entry level or even, we want them to, to excel into mid-level executives, if not the senior level the opportunities. And so this is the way, this is part of how we're partnering. CCIM is another one that we partnered. We did a mentorship program with CCIM as well as with REAP, where we're partnering alumni with our employees and for eight months, for nine months, and giving them that one-to-one connection. Again, as you know, the only way that you're going to to excel is having either a sponsor or having a mentor to show you the ropes. You may have a unique situation and having someone who knows who's been in the business, who's been around and sort of knows the ins and outs, that's really the best way to excel and develop. And so one, getting the educational piece, but two, also partnering with someone who has, who's in the business and open those doors for you. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now those programs that you mentioned, I'm actually not as familiar with. So are those uh, internal programs to Christian Wakefield where you're kind of mentoring individuals internally? The mentorship program is internal, but McKenzie and the ELC programs, those are, are, are I'd say, probably global-wise organizations that we partner with. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, one thing I, I wanted to do was um, we have a lot of guests this morning, so I want to go ahead and open up the, the chat uh, to any questions for Sabine, so you can start putting those in the chat now, and uh, or you can raise your virtual hand if you want to just give us the question vir- uh, virtually or uh, Verbally, I should say. So thank you very much for that. So, okay. So, Sabine, that, that's good that, that we hear uh, Christian Wakefield is, is reaching out here. We're glad that that somebody's doing something, right, basically to, to move the ball down the field. And uh, we certainly want to salute your efforts in trying to, to make that happen and, and whatnot. I know one of the biggest things uh, when we look at um, access to capital and, and firms like Christian Wakefield, do you think they're at a position where they might do JV partnerships with other firms or are they not at that point yet where they would consider something like that? Just before the pandemic, we had some conversations about JV partnerships. We actually have a partnership with the Russell team. It's not a JV per se, but it's but we have a huge, huge supply university program that um, we, we equal who's our, our new head of head of supply diversity. He's leading and we have more than doubled our supplier partnerships there. Okay. And we are encouraging 
in every opportunity that we can to include supply and diversity and the minority firms within our within projects and all deals, et cetera. The JV situation, I think, is still being looked at, but able to bring, you know, I'll just take example for our projects, able to bring minority firms, whether it's on the construction side or the design side, or even on the subcontractor level, it's huge. It's giving the opening doors that we've never really had open for our MB, our minority firms or et cetera. So having those opportunities and able to partner with the Cushman and Wakefield where we have global reach is, talk, again, talking about exposure. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's very good and, and very impressive. And at least um, at least the conversation is, is being had uh, because is. there is a, a lot of opportunity there. And I'm sure you'll be in the middle of those, those discussions as they develop. So that's a fantastic thing. And I don't think Colliers has ever done any, um, or not Colliers, excuse me, Cushman Wakefield. Colliers was a Colliers was a prior prior home. So let me get that straight. But um, I don't think they've ever done any uh, LP investments in any uh, type of deals, correct? They have not, not, not to my knowledge. Not to okay. my knowledge. Gotcha, gotcha. Very good, very good. So. So if, if you were, oh, actually, uh, Quinn just dropped something in here. Let's go ahead and grab that right quick. Where do you see the greatest career advancement and entrepreneurship opportunities for women and POC and CRE? So how would you answer that? Wow. Where is the greatest opportunity? I'd say the sky's the limit. Sky is the limit. I, I think, again, if you look at the statistics, we are, women are, 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 are ex- expanding. I think just in, just again, in Cushman Wakefield, we just named a head of our CW services program, African-American woman. We just named a president of one of our regions, Marla, again, woman. So I think the, the sky's the limit. I don't know that we want to limit ourselves in which area. There's so many opportunities within real estate itself, um, especially commercial real estate. Again, we can talk, we can go down the financial side, we can go down the services side. There's so many opportunities that are wide open. Yeah, yeah. All right, sounds good. Sounds good. Let me ask you this: What, what do you think um, things that the market is going and how things are going to look uh, with rising interest rates? Um, and other things. Uh, do you think this will fall into a recession? I'm kind of asking you more of an economics type question. <laughs> but um, you've, you've been in the game for a long time. So, I mean, how do you think things are going to shape up so folks can start positioning themselves going forward? Yeah, I, I'm certainly not in that arena, but I can just, from what I see, let's put it this way. the I'd say about right pre, post a pre-pandemic, we saw a lot of headquarter projects, a lot of corporations coming into Atlanta in particular, and great opportunities. We had 300,000 square foot projects on the table. I don't see that anymore. I don't see those large projects as much as we did back then. We're doing the much smaller, the smaller projects, the 20,000 square foot ones, the 10,000 square foot ones. Those are more many in numbers. So in moving forward, I don't see the immediate future changing that. I think we're going to still continue seeing those smaller projects, but in numbers and whether it's a renovation, whether it's a downsize, whether it's a new relocation, whether it's a uh, repositioning, that's where I see probably the next 12 months going. Again, we may be surprised about this recession and and things might open up, but in, on our lens, that's what we're seeing a lot more. Gotcha. Gotcha. So all things, uh, just keep pushing forward, you know, trying to accomplish your goals then. Right, from that standpoint, not stopping. Yeah, because both of us have been through quite a few cycles. Uh, Indeed. So, you know, yeah, it goes up and down and comes back around. So Indeed. Yeah, Indeed. Kind of Stay in the hunt. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> hey, Nicole, how are you doing this morning? I see you got a question here for Sabine. What steps or avenue would you recommend one take to get hired into commercial CRE if they are already a seasoned professional and not just graduating college? So what do you think about that? Um, I guess it depends on which arena. So which 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 market, which um, area would be would be my question. Okay, all right, PDS. PDS. What's the best avenue? Obviously, networking. <laughs> <laughs> networking. Net, networking will be would be is certainly helpful in opening doors. Again, I think we all know how our business works. Is if you have that inside connection, that's the best way of getting in. But, you know, I talked about this before, is really showing up, 
right? Making sure your your all your your credentials, your you know, a lot of people come to me and say, "said I want to I want to do what you do," and I always say, "Okay." It may look glamorous to you, but it's really hard work. And there's a lot of skills, especially in the PDS, in the, the PDS world. You need to know how to read floor plans. You need to know how, how, what to do in a construction site. Because again, a, a company like Coca-Cola, a company like, again, Fortune 500 companies, they're coming to you as, for your expertise. So you are being, you're, you are representing them, not only when the lease is being negotiated and you're able to look at a work letter and 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 give them their your give them your advice and your really your your examining what that is and making sure they're getting the best bang for their buck right obviously it all has to be negotiated but you they this is why you're hiring you're being hired not only that and then moving forward once the, once we have a design team on board we have a construction team on board they're looking for to you to manage that process and manage the construction throughout until you give them the keys to move in. And so knowing that process, knowing how to how to navigate all those avenues, whether you're talking to the architect, whether you're talking to the subcontractor, the electrician, the site, whether it's whether it's a um, site development, all of that comes into play. So you need to if you're if you want to be in the, the PDS world, you really need to know all aspects of a project of a of a deal as well as a project. If not, you're really not going to excel and move up the chain as you may want to because that's where the you know again you can go into a landlord. There's a landlord side of PDS where you're working. You're really representing the landlord with, with tenants as opposed to what I do is I'm representing the tenant. Okay. All right. So, hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, Nicole, hopefully that, that uh, sets you straight on, on that question. All right, so thank you for that. Um, e. Jordan wanted to know, can you explain how to find a sponsor? Networking. <laughs> <laughs> it all goes back to the same point, right? It goes back to networking. You know, again, I go back to my, my first one you know, million square foot project. Had I not been in touch and had I not been in connection with the person who gave me this opportunity, I wouldn't be where I am today. And again, especially with our community, we don't really have those those accesses and resources at our fingertips. So go go to these functions in the evenings, meet people, introduce yourselves, make some phone calls, find a friend who knows somebody. And that's how you open the doors. That's how you open the doors. And that's how you find a sponsor. No one's going to walk up to you and say, I want to be your sponsor. So you you have to do the legwork. You have to do the legwork and put the put the onus on yourself to making sure those contacts are made. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I, I wanted to mention also that um, in harmony with it, it takes time. You know, it takes time. You know, it's, it's really going to find somebody that's just going to attack you and say, sure, follow me. And I'll, it's just not going to happen because that's people right. still work with people they know, like, and trust. That's right. right. So it's just going to take a little bit of time. And, you know, but it's, it's building that momentum. And so mm-hmm. once people get used to seeing you and, and communicating with you and whatnot, then you can kind of grow from there. So yeah. yeah, yeah, it goes back. You have to be in the room, right? Yeah, you got to be in the room. So think about the services the that you buy, right? If you don't know that it's there, that's right. You're not going to buy them from that company, that's, right? So, that's right. That's yeah, right. Very good point. And one thing I just wanted to make make a different differentiate, which people don't um, don't sometimes mix them up. So there's a difference between a mentorship and a sponsorship. Mentorship is obviously a mentee and mentor relationship, and they're going to guide you through your process as much as possible, and hopefully a long term relationship. A sponsor, a sponsor is going to open up those doors and bring you into the room where you need to be for advancement. So that's the two differences. So again, trying to get that sponsor, that person needs to know you exist and needs to know and believe who you are and know that you have the ability to, to excel and develop because again, their name is on the line. So they need to trust, <laughs> they need to trust you that you are going, you're not going to mess up. And they are, they're literally putting their name in front of someone to the, make sure that you are in the, you're in the right place. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's step number one, right? You got to make sure that you're going to protect the, the sponsor's name and reputation. So thank you for bringing that up. Ms. Redwine, I'm going to circle right back to you. I want to finish this with, with Nicole. She had one other part of her question. Uh, what credentials or certification would you recommend? So what, for PDS? <clears throat> yeah, I'm assuming that's related to PDS. For PDS, again, it, in terms of education, in terms of, of degrees, 
we it could be an engineer, you can be an architect, you could be a designer. There's really not one single path. I, I'd say some someone within that realm, but there's people who have come into the into the business without any without any of those degrees, but able to manage and and learn within that. A lot of people ask me about PMP. I'm not going to knock it. And if you have it, that's great. That's not something that I have. And I've, I've been in the business you know, now over 30 years and I've never needed it. But again, I know it's a different world coming into the business right now, whereas some of the things that weren't required 20 years ago are required now. So I'm not going to knock it. In my opinion, PMP is more for an IT project management or, world, not necessarily on a CRE or even a project management for what I do. For PDS. Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah. And if it doesn't, Nicole, I'm sure you can reach out to Sabine at some networking event. That's right. <laughs> talk to her a little bit more about it. So appreciate that. Uh, T Red Wine, what is the process for local, small, minority commercial brokerages to be considered for partnership with Cushman on various relocation opportunities? And I think um, we're talking about Dallas Fort Worth. Again, I would I would recommend anyone going on our go our, on our uh, website. And if you go to, I believe if you go to the supplier diversity section, there is a link right on our website that goes straight to our supplier diversity program. And all you need to do is register your name and your information and you're in our database. And again, our goal, our supplier diversity goal is really to get more and new partners into the program. And so right there on our link, you're able to get that. Okay. All right. Fantastic. And uh, let's see, Bruce Kellogg. Bruce, good morning. How you doing, Bruce? He had a question. What is Christian Wakefield doing to hire and retain people with disabilities? And he actually mentioned physical and mental. So that's uh, an out-the-box question. We don't get that too often. So I'm not HR. It's <laughs> <laughs> a preface it. I'm not HR, so I really can't speak on on HR, but I can tell you, again, um, one of our employee resource groups is really focusing on disabilities and and disadvantage. So we have a vet ERG that's also established for, again, within within our company, and they have their own initiatives. So I can't really speak directly on that, but that is, again, just like we are with with minorities and Blacks, et cetera, we we have a funnel for that as well. Very good, very good. So let me ask this, um, what would you, if we were to look, let's say five years down the road, how would you like this space to look as it relates to minority involvement in commercial real estate? So I'm giving you an opportunity to step back and just dream a little bit. What would you like to see? What would you like to read about in the papers? I would certainly, if my if I had my crystal ball and if I had all my wishes met, I would love to see us grow women and minorities, especially our Black community, grow from, like I said, the single digits to a double digit percentage within our firm. And not just at the lower level, but across all levels, including senior management, et cetera. That would be my ideal. And that's across all our commercial real estate companies. That would be a success. Okay. All right. That's a good way to look at it. That would be a success. All right. Latrice had a question also. Is MBE, WBE certification required for vendor consideration? It's not required. Um, no, you can you can sim- you can you can register, but there is an emphasis on MBEs and WBEs. Okay, all right, very good. Quinn wants to know. Quinn wants to know. All right, as both a woman of color and a leader at the director level with your company, why do you feel that there's a need for employee resource groups, and why are they beneficial? So let's take that first part. Why do you feel that they are necessary? I had this conversation um, just last week. So employee resource groups, in my opinion, in in a very large company, we are close to 55,000 employees Mm -hmm. global. And again, if we look at the numbers, we're a very small number. I think it's very important to have a sense of home, right? When you're at home and your family, having that family unit is important to you, right? You know who to go to. Coming into a, co- a corporate world like we, like Cushman and Wakefield, and you're literally, you're the only one in the room. You're probably the only one on the floor. And not and knowing that you have somebody, you have a Sabine to call or somebody who looks like you, who may not be in the same city, but maybe in the same, in the same arena. Maybe you're in PDS and able to bounce things off of. 
I'll give you an example. I had a, one of my main clients, I'm not going to name any names, had a group of people on site on at their location. And he has been at the company six plus years. Never knew we had an ERG because he doesn't come into our office every day. He's literally working at a, at a, at a client site for the past six years. When, we, when he and I met and I explained all of the benefits of developments that we're doing within our group, within our ERG and all the opportunities. And he was in a position where he had not, he had not received his, his review and et cetera. And I gave him some channels. I gave him some people to call, some, some resources to look into, find out what your what the pay range is for your for that in particular area. A month passed by and he came back and he's like, Sabine, you were right on point. I did exactly what you did and I got exactly what I wanted. Mm-hmm. Now, again, if he didn't know to reach me as, again, as someone, as a sister, as a big sister, whatever you want to call it, he probably wouldn't have known that. And no one within his area or his group has even has leaned in to even help him out. So that's the importance of a resource group is knowing that you have somebody that you can count on and, and, and lead you or even give you some guidance on, on how to navigate within a, a large company. Again, it doesn't have to be large, but within, within your organization. Okay. All right. That sounds good. I'm sure Quinn appreciates that. He also wanted to know uh, what specific organizations would you encourage getting involved with for networking and CRE? Oh, wow. <laughs> the list is long. <laughs> yeah, <an> easy question. <laughs> <laughs> the list is long. Obviously, Reef is, is one of them. Gosh, we just had a, an event last week with Circle of Trust. If you're in Atlanta, that's another another good one. I'm also on the board of Cornet. So we have a big, a big ed forum coming up next week. Huge opportunity, not only to meet commercial real estate professionals, but also our our end users, which are the the all of our companies that are that are a part of Cornet. The list is extremely, I don't want to leave anybody out, but they're the list is extremely long and and that could be a sidebar, again, depending which direction you want to go to. Okay. All right. I was actually going to ask you a little bit about that because um you are a committee member with uh with Cornet and what what really is is your focus there? What are you trying to accomplish uh, with Cornet at this time? <laughs> it goes back to the same, and okay. so I'm I'm part of the what they call DAC, which is Diversity in Action Committee. Um, so I'm a member a member of that uh, group, and again, bringing diversity within Cornet. It, the past years has really has not been a lot of diversity. Again, just look at our industry. Mm-hmm. And so our goal is to just bring in more diversity across, whether it's our panels, our events, our networking events, all of that. We have a young, young group, a young professionals group. Love to have more diversity there as well. All right, gotcha. Someone just mentioned uh, uh, Will Smith. What is Cornet? So oh, wow. can you elaborate on that a little bit? Cornet, it's C-O-R-E capital N-E-T. And it is, I believe, 20 years old. In most major cities, there's a Cornet chapter. We have an Atlanta chapter. Like I said, I'm happy happy to have you all come in. I know we have a big discussion next week about, again, diversity in real estate. And I believe some REAP, Quinn Green, Green will be one of our panelists. Would love to have you all attend. Um, again, it's all the effort of, of diversifying commercial real estate um, and bringing more more diversity, whether it's at the at the professional level, but also at the end user level. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, does that answer the question, Will, as to what exactly is Cornet? Okay. Right. Oh, and I forgot crew. I said I saw a comment about crew. I was a past crew member. So I crew is another great event, another great mm-hmm. opportunity and organization. I'm actually a crew leadership alum. So thank you for reminding me. <laughs> All right, fantastic. I tell you what, Will also wants to know about the details for Cornet next week. So if, if you get a chance before we wrap up, you can put that in the chat. I sure will. Or, or email me and I'll make sure I get it out to Reef and we will get it out to everybody or however you want to handle it. That would be great. Fantastic. Uh, then, then you're also uh, working with BizNow as a uh, diversity board member as well, right? Same same deal again. BizNow, as you know, again, is national. In particular, our goal for the uh, diversity committee is also to again, diversify the panel. And we'd like to see that every panel discussion, there is a diverse group of 
of panelists and attendees within those organizations, within within the events that are happening monthly, or even sometimes even more than that. So that is our goal. And we've been doing both internal and external work with them, which has been going, it's going well. Yeah, very good. Quinn, thanks for putting that in the chat. So there, there's the information we'll right there for you. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Quinn. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I wanted to mention something also that, um, you know, that, that stays on my mind. And there's two things. You have, um, <clears throat> number one, you mentioned a lot about being the only one in the room, the only one on the floor, et cetera, et cetera. And what, what I found, and I don't know if, if you find this to be the same way, but there almost is initially a skepticism as to whether you can actually perform because they've never seen a min- another minority in this space before. Uh, have you found that to be the case as well, or, or is that kind of a vibe that you pick up on sometimes? Yes, and I, I'm going to quote Carla Harris, and I had an opportunity to meet her a few years ago and ask some, a somewhat of a similar question, and her answer to me was, Sabine, always, you will always be the only one, right, in most cases, mm-hmm. and you just have to come in and show up right? Know that they're going to question your ability. They're going to question your ethics. They're going to question why you're even in the room. And so coming in authentically, again, as I talked about, make sure your credentials are straight, make sure you come in ready because you will be challenged and not be, not to be malicious or anything, but that you will be challenged. You look different than you, than they, than they are. And so they're going to challenge you and, and question you and question why you're in the room. But coming in and being prepared and ready, there's nothing they can do. You've got your stuff. You got it. And if they don't, you know what? That's okay. Somebody else will, will open the door. Yeah, yeah. And we'll appreciate you. So that, that's a very good point. So thank you for bringing that up. And that that kind of goes into the second part of, of what stays on my mind and I often think about, which is the reason why we kind of focused on this subject for this month. I see you've done some work with um, Sir Haiti. Yes. And, uh, you know, it, it's quite interesting because I, I remember that situation with Haiti. It was the awful earthquake and you had all these relief efforts and, you know, songs and all this stuff and all this money raised. And then you look at Haiti today and, and it hasn't really moved the needle much. Now, I don't know if that money got there and was wasted or if it never got there. I mean, it seems like, as you mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, that when the news cycle changes, Sometimes they just, you know, put that money back in the pocket and say, okay, well, we'll just leave that over here right now. Or it's a situation where it's like we can't find anybody to give this money to. So let's just put it back in our pocket and give it to the same channels we always give it to. Um, Do you run across any of that or what's your thoughts on that? (laughs) Very close and dear to my heart, um, especially with Haiti. And yes, I'm on the Serve Haiti board um, as well. (laughs) One of the many boards that I'm on. And I, I, I preface to say is I think people have good intent, right? And whenever the, whether it's the earthquake or the hurricane, especially in Haiti, people have opened their, their pockets and just say, what can I do? The amount of phone calls. And, and for those of you who don't know, I was actually born in Haiti. I'm actually Haitian American, if you want to call that, um, came here when I was five, but have many roots still in Haiti, et cetera. And um, Serve Haiti is one of the organizations that I serve as well as Kasoni, which is in New York which is the Caribbean American board that I'm on as well. Mm-hmm. And I say to say, I, people want to help and they want to monetarily provide and, and see what they can do. Vet who you are giving money to. Not everybody has good intent. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to name names, but there are some, several large organizations where if you're giving them $10, maybe 50 cent of it is going into Haiti. The rest is is operations. It's he, it's overhead. It's all of the above, and you're no really yeah. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so, not to say that I have all the answers, but really vet to see before you give your money and open up your pocketbook. Vet who you're giving that money to to make sure it's actually going to going somewhere. There's so many different roadblocks, whether it's customs, whether it's the ports, whether it's just the officials that you have to go through to making that 50 cents worth something or make it happen, make make something nice happen or as what as what you're, what you're looking for. Vet it, vet it, especially with Haiti. If you want to give me a call or send me a note, I'm happy to give you a list of, of organizations. Serve Haiti. Serve Haiti's purpose is Glombois, which is a, a um a small, a smaller area up in Haiti, north side, closer to Dominican Republic. 
and we're doing strides there on the medical side. We've opened up a medical clinic where people are able to come in and, and, and the lines are long, but just to get healthcare, especially with this pandemic and everything else, um, we're doing great strides. That's an, I, that's an organization that I believe in and I'm part of, and I, and I can assure you that the money is going exactly where it needs to go. Um, and there's many more, there's many more. So I'd say, do your homework, do your homework and just make sure that you're, what you're, if you're giving that $10 that it's being used for that. Yeah, yeah, very good point. And you mentioned also even large corporations, you know, being on the finance side, I've uh, looked into the financials of a lot of nonprofits and you're like, man, you know, the money is just, like you said, operations and everything else, right? And it's never really getting where it's supposed to go. So appreciate you bringing that up. Um, there's one other thing I, I want to make sure that we touch on as well. And this question comes up a lot especially with ones that are a little bit more senior in the commercial real estate space, and that's serving on boards. And it seems like you've been successful in being able to uh, get on on multiple boards. Um, What advice would you give to individuals who might want to have that aspiration uh, going forward in order to serve on boards that they have a a passion for? Again, I think you hit hit it right on on the nail on the head is be passionate about it. The boards that I serve on, I'm extremely passionate about. I get to devote a lot of my personal time to being to being on the board mm-hmm. and you have to be active just to say you're on the board. That's not really not going to, you know, it may look good on your resume, but what is that really? What are you really serving? And so I'd say find a board, find a, an organization that you are truly passionate about, that you're going to be action or orientated My whole purpose, again, is being impactful in our community and whichever way I can. And so the boards that I'm part of is very close and dear to my beliefs, my values, my initiatives, my goals, helping who I, again, the, the communities that I, I serve. Yeah, very good point. So that's, that's a good way to get started. And I guess sometimes maybe starting off with the nonprofits and then that might graduate to publicly traded companies and the like. Correct. So very good point. All right. You know, I do want to conclude on, on this point just briefly that, um, one of the things that, that I've heard multiple times from corporations is we just can't find any minorities that we can deploy this money to. And we're just not, you know, running across any. And, and you know, obviously, my first reaction is always, well, give me a call. I can give you a list of them. Right. And I'm sure the same thing for you, Sabine. You know, plenty of people that will uh, take advantage of opportunities that are minorities that will, will participate in that space. And I think it just goes to help us to appreciate that. The more exposure there is out there and the more opportunities and the more advancement that that you make, you're able to reach out and say, hey, call this person, reach out, because that mentor could be another minority, you know, and and that's kind of a a shift that I'm seeing, you know, for so many years, it it needed to be someone else in order to get us in. But now we're kind of getting to the point where there are more minorities in the space where they can help others in that in that future generation. So. As we wrap up today, what final comments would you have on on that, knowing that your passion is really uh, to try to see more minorities uh, advance in the commercial real estate space? What closing thoughts would you have for us? I would say is lean in and pass, be an impact, pass it on, pass it on. And if you are in the real, in the commercial real estate space, bring somebody else on, bring somebody else in. That's the only way that we're going to make progress and move it forward. I'm very much a believer of paying it forward. And so whatever I can do to, to help that minority to get into the business is what I'm going to do. Yeah, the excuse about we can't find candidates, I dispel that every single time, mm-hmm. every single time. And like you, I will say, tell me what the job description is. I will get you a minimum of three, four qualified yeah. candidates. And again, I say qualified because not everybody's qualified for each each role. Mm-hmm. But if you're trying to go on in, in, and I don't want to get name names, but if you go on these job postings, you're not going to just get anybody. You're not going to get our community responding. You need to be able to be to go to the right places, right? And as Quinn, I just saw your note about A Rep. A Rep is also a great organization that you have great opportunities, great resources, great members that are available. So I dispel any of those, <laughs> any of those thoughts about not finding qualified community, our community into, for these roles. 
not gonna not buying it. Call me any day and I'll give you a list of people. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. No, it's I'm the same way. You know, we can certainly uh, get you what you need if, if that's what you're looking for. So very, very fine points. Um, you know, we certainly appreciate all the work that you're doing. You know, we also want to ask that uh, for individuals that are enjoying this, we ask you to uh, please give us a review if you like what you've heard today and Sabine's uh, fantastic input by uh, giving us a review on the uh, wherever you get your podcast or if you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe there as well. So we certainly appreciate that. And uh, Sabine, I, I certainly want to give you credit for all your outstanding work and, and being willing to put your neck out there on the line and, and be that leader if you will. And, and one thing that you mentioned about uh, qualifying for the role is, um, you know, we got to step up, we got to perform, you know, don't, don't look for handouts. And one thing that I will say that I, I see much more often nowadays is that people are qualified. There are certainly minorities that are qualified to do anything out here in any role. So it's a fantastic opportunity for everyone to push forward and, um, and go from there. So Sabine, any final thoughts? No, um, happy to, to in, like I said, on my side, on the Cushman and Wakefield side, if you feel that you there's roles on our career site and if there's something that sparks your interest, things that you're qualified for, send me a quick email, send me a note. Happy to push that forward as much as I can. Again, my goal is to, to increase our numbers um, drastically over the next few years. All right. Well, Sabine, so, we really appreciate I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, anybody? No, you? no. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the platform. You know, this is great. I'd like to reach as many as many people as we can. Yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic. You know, I was just thinking it would have been crazy if we would have ran into each other at a Brooklyn Tech reunion or something. That would have been nuts. There's one in November. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Our hundredth year is November celebration. Oh, no. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Obviously, you stay tied in with that as well. So good stuff, good stuff. Well, Sabine, it's been a pleasure. And, um, you know, I, I didn't ask you what year you graduated, so we'll talk about that offline. <laughs> I'll show my I'll show my age if I tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I might want to hide mine too, but it's all good. We, we're both seniors in the space, so it's a beautiful thing. But, um, no, this has been great. It's been a great conversation. We certainly appreciate the time. We know you got a ton of things to do. Appreciate the lovely family you got there behind you in the pictures. Oh, my posse. Uh, there you go. There you go. Fantastic stuff. And I'm sure we'll be bumping into each other real soon at, at some function. So thank you so much for uh, being here today and look forward to catching up with you real soon. Excellent. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Mornings with Joel CRE podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to write a brief review. And as always, continue to invite, share, and subscribe.